Everybody that's joining the webinar today, we're just going to give two minutes to um, potential latecomers just so that everybody can listen in. So if everybody wouldn't mind holding for two more minutes and then we'll get started. Okay, so let's get started. Um, once again, a very warm welcome to everybody that's joined us here. My name is Robert Breer. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Olpegeter, and I'm joined today by Richard Vine, our CEO, and by Anik Mitchell, our um, Head of Tourism, and by William Ndrogi, who's our Head of IT, who's going to kindly make sure that this uh, continues smoothly. This is our first ever webinar, so please do bear with us um, when it comes to the internet we're in the middle of nowhere, we're running off a generator, uh, and so there is every possibility we'll drop in and out, but we'll do our best today. So why are we doing a webinar in the first place? Well, over the last few months in particular, we've had so many different questions uh, coming to us at Old Pegeta about conservation, about tourism, about the northern white rhino, since we have the last of the northern whites on Old Pegeta. Um, and we realized that a lot of people um, would like to hear more about the conservation story that underpins the tourism activities. So if we look at everybody who signed up for the webinar today, we've got quite a mix today of agents, operators, interested parties, conservationists, NGOs, uh, and we're hoping that what we'll go through today will have a little bit for everybody. We are very happy to take questions as we go through, uh, but we are on, um, everybody will be on mute. So if you could just please type your questions in, they will pop up on our screen as we go through. Uh, and then we'll happily um, try and answer your question as we go through, or we'll tackle, handle some of the questions at the end of the, uh, the session. So without further ado, I will hand over straight away to our CEO, Richard Vine. He's going to talk through conservation and community development. Uh, then after that, we'll come Anik talking about the tourism offering. And finally, um, our head of marketing is away at the moment, uh, so I will be covering off um, how we reach the world with our marketing at the moment as best we can. So over to you, Richard. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody from Kenya. Um, the slide you've got in front of you is a, a sort of graphic rep representation of how Old Pegeta operates. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization, but that doesn't mean to say that we don't try to operate uh, as commercially as possible uh, with a view to making as big a pot of cash as possible, all of which by virtue of our not-for-profit status gets reinvested back into conservation uh, and community development. Uh, community development, in our view, and many others, being integral to the success of our conservation activity. Obviously, not all of our operations are profit-making. Um, we, we depend primarily upon tourism, uh, but we also have quite a significant agricultural element to our to our company. Um, and we have ar around about 640 uh, employees uh, and a significant security operation uh, to safeguard our wildlife populations, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. This slide shows the, um, this This is a, a map of Old Pegeta. The, the light green area is the actual conservancy area. The area to the south in sort of pink and purple, apologies for the colors, is our agricultural area, primarily wheat integrated with cattle, uh, as well as the um, the area to the west known as Surama in light blue, um, which we use for intensive cattle production and also um, 
the, uh, the management of endangered species. This, this next map shows a picture of our Pegeta uh, as it sits in the overall landscape. As you can see, we sit um, to the south of Lycipia, and we are connected from a wildlife perspective and landscape perspective all the way through uh, to through Lycipia and into uh, the areas that we refer to as the Northern Rangelands Trust. So those those areas that you see on the map in sort of orange yellow are community owned conservancies that are managed under the auspices and with the support of the Northern Rangelands Trust. So it's a big landscape, a big wildlife landscape that we're talking about. And as I say, El Pegeta remains um, completely connected to, to that wild scape. The way we retain our connectivity is through corridors which are built into our fences. So by virtue of the fact that we're a rhino sanctuary, sanctuary uh, we're actually the biggest black rhino sanctuary in Eastern Africa. We uh, have to be fenced. Um, and the reason for the fences is really to stop rhinos going out more than it is to stop uh, people coming in, which is the common misconception. Um, and in the northern part of our fence, we maintain three corridors. The picture you've got in front of you is one of the smaller corridors. Uh, and it's designed to be rhino proof, but everything else permeable. So as you can see, there's an elephant able to cross it, uh, and rhinos are stopped from going through by virtue of a, a loosely constructed stone wall, uh, and offset or set back from that a row of posts, the gaps between which are too small for rhinos to easily pass. And being creatures of habit, um, unless there's a really good need for them to go through a corridor of this nature, they just wouldn't bother. So we hope to retain that, that wildlife connectivity uh, at the same time as keeping our rhinos safe. And the importance of that is shown, shown by this map here, which is actually a topographic representation of the previous map of the Lycipia and Northern Rangelands Trust landscape that I showed you. Um, the colors are the tracks of individually collared elephants, GPS collared elephants, where the position of those animals was, was recorded over a period of about six months, uh, once every 15 minutes. The elephant in red is an elephant called Kimani, uh, he spends about six months of his time on Old Pegeta per year, and for the remaining part of the year, in response to seasonal rainfall patterns, he escapes northwards um, towards the Matthews Range, which is that range of mountains smack bang in the middle of your picture. He spends time in a place called Serra, which is one of the new rhino conservancies that has just been started in Kenya over the past few months, uh, and then meanders uh, back to Old Pegeta um, later on in the year. So that, that demonstrates the need for this wildlife connectivity uh, which gives us resilience within the ecosystem, and that's obviously critically important for us. Hang on a second. Um, sorry, right, next next slide. This this shows so so primarily our you know our signature species is is black rhinos. We're a we're a black rhino sanctuary, all, albeit we um we um carry and, and and host all of the other sort of normal species of wildlife that you would expect uh, in an East African context. Uh, the sanctuary was started with the Sweetwaters Game Reserve in 1989 with a founder population uh, of actually only four individuals that was built up to 20 by about 1992, I think it was, or three. And since then, we've grown fairly steadily uh, to the point now that we have 107 or 106 black rhinos, making us, as I said earlier, the biggest black rhino sanctuary uh, in Eastern Africa. What's interesting about this graph is that we, we are now reaching carrying capacity. The... Um, the reason that's important is that the National Black Rhino Management Strategy um, states that sanctuaries must maintain their populations at some point below ecological carrying capacity in order to maximize population growth rates. So by 2017, we'll be up to about 120, 121 animals, which is considered to be our carrying capacity, at which stage we will either have to move animals, uh, black rhinos, that is, out of the sanctuary to make room for, for the remaining population or find more space into which the expanding population uh, can move. And I'll talk about that in a minute or two. Just to give you some background on, on, on the sort of poaching situation in Kenya, uh, I think there's a common misconception that Kenya is one of the worst affected countries uh, by poaching for rhinos and elephants. Uh, and actually, that's completely incorrect, which is not to say it has been unaffected, certainly, um, as is the case with with um, with all uh, African countries, we've we've had to we've 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 felt the impact of of, of poaching against uh, rhinos and elephants over the last five years or so. This shows what's happened in Kenya from a rhino perspective. 2013 was our worst year, 
But since that time, as a result of concerted effort by both government and the private sector, uh, the rate of loss of rhinos uh, has diminished significantly. I think right now, this year, we're sitting on about seven or eight rhinos lost to poaching. So we'd expect about 10 by the end of the year, uh, which compares very favor favorably uh, with, with uh, 2013, for example. And this is a situation that is mirrored, mirrored by uh, what has happened to elephant poaching in Kenya. It's been very well uh, contained, and not, which is not to say that it doesn't happen, but certainly um, better contained than it was in 2012 and 2013, to the point now that it's, uh, you would argue that it's probably sustainable and elephant populations are growing again. Uh, unfortunately, this is in contrast to what is happening to other parts of Africa, particularly Tanzania, for example, where elephant poaching is completely out of control. Uh, Mozambique, the same thing. Uh, and rhino poaching, as you will have read in the press, in places like South Africa, uh, is also now reaching the point where uh, populations are likely to be uh, diminishing as a result. So in order to, to, um, to maintain our rhino populations and protect them, we invest a huge amount in, in security. Um, the way that we view our security operation, it's rather like the, uh, the, 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 the skins of an onion. Um, so the outer skin is, is our community development program. That's, as I said earlier, considered to be incredibly important in terms of making sure that we have good community relationships, uh, which in turn result in the communities valuing us uh, and also therefore uh, protecting us. The, um, the next sort of line of defense is our boundary fence. I mentioned that earlier as well, albeit with corridors built into it, but it's a fully electrified fence. It's uh, monitored on a 24 seven basis. If it's breached for whatever reason, it has to be repaired within two hours, day or night. Uh, and so that's, that's obviously a, a critical part of the kind of defense mechanism uh, on Old Pedge. We then have um, cattle herders and general security. These are unarmed people who are on the conservancy. They act as eyes and ears. Um, uh, and they're supported by what we refer to as our rhino patrols. Uh, the, the, the role of rhino patrols is to see each and every single rhino at least once every three days. So we've got a, we've got a total population here of around about 133 or, or four rhinos, uh, if you include our white rhinos, uh, which means, or which gives you an indication of the kind of patrolling effort that we, we put into to securing um, the property uh, if, if, if every one of those animals has to be seen uh, once every three or four days. Those rhino patrols are then supported by our armed teams. We have um, 46 um, what are, are referred to as Kenya police reservists. They're, um, night, they're, they're highly trained. Um, they're, they're night vision, uh, sorry, night, uh, night um, they're, they're able to operate at night. Um, they are um, armed with automatic weapons. Um, they're split into four man teams. Uh, they live in the bush. Uh, and they really are the kind of teeth um, of the, the overall security operation. Um, and they in turn are supported by aircraft and uh, new technologies which we're beginning to develop, uh, which hopefully we can begin uh, in time to deploy cost effectively, in particular the use of dogs. We've started our own dog section. Uh, this is using primarily Belgian Malinois dogs, um, which are reputed to be uh, hardy animals resistant to disease as well as uh, being able to cope with the kind of disease, uh, sorry, not disease, but heat and, and, and uh, climatic uh, conditions that they face uh, when operating in and around Old Pegeta. We, um, we obviously have a, you know, an enormous number of, of species here. Um, and we, depending on which species it is, uh, the, 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 the amount of effort we spend in terms of monitoring uh, that species and trying to protect it uh, varies. Um, so our sort of key endangered species are black rhino, uh, white rhino. Uh, we'll talk about the northern white rhino, of which there are only uh, four left in the world a little bit later on. Uh, Jackson's hartebeest, which is a locally endangered species of antelope. Oryx, which is not really endangered across Kenya, but certainly is fairly scarce here, for which we have recovery programs. Uh, and the, the grevy zebra. Uh, we have a small herd here of 17 grevy zebra which is in the same enclosure, the same 600 enclosure as the northern white rhinos. Um, and it's a herd which uh, we're, we're, we're protecting with a view to growing its numbers in the hope that we can then use, uh, which, which we can, in the hope that we can then use that herd to repopulate both Old Pegeta and other areas where, where the Grevy zebra have become uh, removed or, or, or um, become very scarce. Um, in common with other parks in East Africa, we have all of the sort of big five in good numbers. 
So lion numbers stand right now at around 70 animals. Cheetahs have diminished in numbers a, a number a little bit over the past three or four years, probably because of too many lions. But we certainly have about 20 cheetahs, and they move on and off here quite regularly. Leopards are actually common, but rarely seen, as you might imagine. Wild dogs, again, come and go. Right now, we don't uh, have too many here, but they come in big packs uh, occasionally. And hyenas are very plentiful. And then, of course, there's all the other sort of normal species that you would expect to see. Um, elephants, there's a population of around about 7,000 elephants across the Lycipia sort of Samburu ecosystem, and probably around about 300 would be present uh, on Old Pejisra at any one time. Uh, our southern white rhino population uh, stands at 22 or 3 at the moment, I think it is. And of course, we have the chimpanzee, the Sweetwaters Chimpanzee Sanctuary, um, where there are, I think, 34 chimpanzees uh, in total. One of the things we're very proud of is the fact that um, our success from a conservation perspective is demonstrated by this graph, uh, which shows the, the on a year-by-year -year basis the movements, the total movements of wildlife both in and out through our corridors. And you'll notice that we've got a net movement outwards of wildlife. Um, and that's a reflection of the fact that we're now beginning to act as a source population for wildlife in general uh, to restock other areas uh, of, of, of wildlife habitat, uh, particularly to our north. Um, and I'll talk about that again in a second or two. Um, but we have been successful from a conservation perspective. Wildlife numbers here are good. And as is typical in these kinds of situations where overcrowding starts to become a problem, wildlife will tend to try to move out to uh, populate other areas which are more, uh, more scarcely or, or less occupied. Um, and that, that's, that, that's what's happening here. So, I mentioned earlier that we, as Old Pegeta, will need to be looking for more space for our Black Rhino program. Uh, but we're also inter interested, obviously, in securing as much conservation um, space as we possibly can. Uh, I don't know if you can recall the original map I showed you of Old Pegeta, but this shows you our expansion plans to the north, uh, where we're working with a government-owned ranch, in fact, called Motara, um, to the point that they have now provided us with a uh, block of land which is about 20,000 acres in extent where the elephant uh, is sitting on this map, uh, which we're managing on their behalf, uh, both for wildlife uh, and for tourism. So that is land uh, which is now becoming accessible to anybody who visits Old Pegeta, and that's a process, uh, the expansion process is something that we would like to see uh, happening more and more as we go forwards, and we certainly have plans uh, to make that happen. What it, what it means is we now have 110,000 acres, which is about 400 square kilometers, just over 400 square kilometers available to us for our black rhino program, which means that our carrying capacity rises from, about, from, from 120 to around about 160. Um, the reason that's important is demonstrated by this map. Actually, one of the biggest problems that faces rhino uh, conservation in this country is not so much the poaching, although clearly that has an impact, it's much more to do with the lack of um, available, uh, properly secured space into which uh, expanding populations, successful populations can move. So Old Pegasus is addressing that, as I explained, by uh, securing uh, Mutara to our north. Um, but the, this map shows the, 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 the fact that over the past four, three, four years, we've lost four rhino sanctuaries in Kenya as a result of the costs, particularly for the private sector, and risks of, of looking, right, looking after rhinos, meaning that people uh, who previously were happy to do that have decided that they no longer uh, want to do it uh, or are capable of being able to meet uh, the costs of doing it. So actually, that's a bigger threat to the rhino populations in Kenya. Uh, and it's something, uh, as I've discussed, that Old Pejita is, is uh, try, trying, to, uh, trying to help uh, redress. Just a quick word about our northern White rhinos, there's been a lot of press attention about this species and this program over the past um, year, 18 months. There are now four left in the world. We have three of them. One is a male. This is him here. His name is Sudan. Unfortunately, he's, um, he's I think, 34 years old, uh, which means he's a very old rhino, uh, which means he will die soon. Uh, and then we have two other females, one of whom is too old to breed and one of whom, who, one of whom uh, is... Well, while she's young enough to breed, has, has reproductive um, issues preventing her from conceiving. So this is a species which is completely on the brink of extinction. Um, what we're doing is working with the original zoo from where these animals came, which is a zoo called the Verkralovi in the Czech Republic. 
The idea is that we will remove eggs from the remaining females, uh, and then we will combine those eggs with sperm from, which is sperm from various um, sperm banks across the world for this species, uh, to create embryos, which will then be implanted into surrogate southern white rhino females with a view to creating eventually purebred northern white rhino calves. Um, that is the hope, but the difficulties are huge because um, the techniques and protocols uh, for the removal of eggs from female rhinos have yet to be developed. And even if um, they existed, uh, the uh, creation of embryos, rhino embryos for implantation into surrogate rhino mothers has never been done either. So the work to perfect those techniques is ongoing at the moment. Unfortunately, it comes at huge cost uh, and funds are somewhat lacking, uh, but we're going to do our best over the next uh, 12 to 24 months uh, to try to make it, to try to make or to try to develop those those methods so that they can be um, they can be replicated or they can be carried out on the remaining northern white rhinos, uh, with a view hopefully to saving that species for perpetuity. Uh, it is a bit of a long long shot, um, but nevertheless we feel um, that we are obliged to try. So all of this ultimately is about people, is the truth. Um, if we don't have the support of people living around us, and I'm talking about our community development program, then anything we do from a conservation perspective is doomed to failure. So we attach a huge amount of importance to that program. We have a population estimated at around 57,000 people that live within a five kilometer radius of our boundaries. Um, those people are um, often very poor and lacking in basic basic infrastructure and basic kind of uh, support services, most of which normally would have been provided by government. So we're involved in this program in supporting schools and education through bursaries, uh, in supporting health facilities and the provision of health services, uh, in agricultural extension, extension services. Uh, we have an energy sector which um, tries to, to provide cheap energy uh, and fuel efficient stoves and such like. Uh, and we're just, about, we're just about to start a water program to safeguard catchments and make water more easily available, particularly for farmers, uh, as well as an enterprise section to basically use, um, the, uh, use the existence of our pegetary as a basis for the creation of viable businesses which um, community groups uh, can make use of. So, you know, this, the, without this program, we, as I said earlier, would cease to exist. And any surplus that we can make, uh, as well as going into conservation, uh, goes into this program, uh, and we also supplement this program with donor donor incomes as, as best we can. So that that that's it from me. Um, I'm now going to hand over to to Rob, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the financials and economics that uh, are involved in running a place like this. Um, hello, everyone. Again, just before I start, there was one question that came up whilst Richard was talking about whether these slides at uh, these slides these slides will be available for download. And the answer is yes, uh, we will post this to our Facebook page once we're complete uh, with a link to the slides so that they're made available to everybody. Um, I just thought it might be interesting for everybody to see the sort of financial reality of, of the Olpegeta model of running a conservancy. We're a little bit unusual in that we really do not rely at all on donor funding. Uh, we make um, pretty much 95% of our own revenue uh, and cover our own expenses every single year. That comes to about $6 million a year, uh, and 80% of that comes from tourism. Uh, we, you know, it is just critically and fundamentally important to us, uh, the visitors that come to Old Petita every year, uh, both from the point of view of revenue and education, and Anik will talk about that more in due course. The other 20% of our revenue comes from uh, agriculture. Uh, we have about uh, 6,500 head of cattle on the conservancy. We have been one of the first uh, conservancies to innovate and integrate cattle with wildlife uh, in a way that tourists don't even notice, but is a, an important revenue generator for us. Uh, and we also have 4,000 acres of wheat to our south as well, which allows us to spread the risk a little bit on the sources of income that we have. So that gives us a good solid pool of revenue, although it has to be said that there probably can't be two more risky businesses than to be in or unstable than tourism and agriculture. Uh, we're very much at the whim of, of global security, Kenya security, and, and the weather. Uh, and this year has been particularly tough. The challenge we have is that nearly all of our revenue disappears straight away in cost. 
Um, it may seem strange given that this is a wilderness, but 70% of our cost is people. We have 640 employees on the Conservancy directly employed by Olpegeta. And once you add in the uh, staff at the hotels and lodges that, that operate on the Conservancy, we're not far off a thousand people that are employed here. And that certainly consumes our expenses. It's also a fundamental role of ours to be providing employment uh, to the surrounding area. Now, we have a little bit of debt, um, mainly things like vehicle, uh, vehicle financing, those kind of things, but we are not, we have a policy of not being debt ridden, so we simply don't take out debt. Um, you know, we're in a very healthy state in that respect. And we are also a fundamental taxpayer, a tax contributor to both uh, the local county and to the national economy of Kenya. Uh, you could argue we could choose to be a tax-free organization, but we think it's very important that we prove that areas of land such as this and conservation can actually contribute uh, to the national economy and to taxation income. And again, it's all part of uh, involving and integrating with local communities. The challenge is that that doesn't leave us very much cash at the end of the year. We have just $300,000 left uh, which is a real knife edge when you're operating somewhere as big and as complex as Olpegeta. And what you see on the far right of the side is um, proportionally the amount of capital expenditure on things like vehicles, expansion into new areas of land, uh, innovation in drones or new databases. You know, we can't even faintly cover that. And, and that's why in future we want to continue to cover our expenses through our own commercial revenues, but we simply have to find investors uh, and donors who can help us uh, by investing in the capital um, side of the business so that we can keep doing new stuff, expanding and doing the things that have been working well so far. So to help us do that, one of the big exercises we've done over the last um, 18 months is we've put, um, we've put together a, 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 a five-year plan um, called our 2020 map, uh, which breaks down exactly what each department is going to do. Um, and at the moment, that's giving the organization a clear focus um, on um, you know, the targets we need to go to, the uh, investments that are needed, uh, the revenues and costs that we need to control. And it's really been the first time for a while we've had something quite so um, uh, clear that we can all work against. Now, that document is publicly available. And again, after this um, webinar, we will post um, that document up onto the web so that everybody can uh, have a read um, at their leisure. Let me just see if I can change the slide. As part of that exercise and putting together that long-term plan, uh, one of the things that we've been looking to do is um, to be very, very clear about what the Olpegeta brand stands for. You know, we've always had a sort of visual identity with, you know, our logo and, and the colors and so on, but we really did a bit of thinking about, you know, what is it that we do and we stand for that we want to stick to? And over the top of it, we have um, set ourselves uh, almost a goal of being role models. You know, we think the 90 to 110,000 acres that we look after are critical, but if we only look after that small area on a global scale, it's not enough. And if we're role models, then we look to try and learn for other conservancies um, and to uh, get involved in legislation at a national level, those kind of things. Uh, and that includes making mistakes, learning from mistakes and sharing those with other people. Within that, there are sort of three key pillars that we try to work against. Uh, the first bit's about being responsible guardians, and that's very much about the safety, security, and keeping the animals, uh, the wildlife safe. The second pillar is really around what we call inspirational innovation. We, we, we like to have a constant sense of curiosity, trying new things. It might be cattle, it might be drones, we might fail, but it's important if we do fail that we share that information with other people so that they can learn from where we've done badly and where we've done well. And the third piece for us is, you know, passionate authenticity. You know, we are a working conservancy. We're not just here to be a, a zoo or a gimmicky organization. And when we look at the things that we do, and, and you'll hear more from Anique on that from a tourism point of view, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's supporting scientifically credible conservation uh, and not just gimmicks uh, for tourism purposes. So... We also went through a process of looking at our brand, um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was really work on this idea of discovery. Um, people getting, giving people the chance to learn about just how fabulous um, and inspirational the wildlife and the environment around them is. Um, and you're gonna hear more from, from Anique shortly on, on that discovery side, 
but I just thought this slide was a bit of fun. For those who can see it clearly, you can probably see the um, gazelle in the middle of the picture, but can you see the leopard that's about to chase and track down the gazelle? So for those of you that are struggling to see it, if you look towards the right hand side, you should be able to see in white the outline of the leopard. Okay, very good. Now that's the end of the section from me, but what I just wanted you to um, hear about was that we think it's quite important that there's a sort of strategic level of thinking over and above it, and that will help you understand a little bit um, what um, Anika and then ultimately with the marketing section we're gonna talk about next. Uh, but there's one question that's just come through uh, from somebody who was just um, noting a concern that sometimes cattle can in fact interrupt lion sightings. Um, that could be the case, it can happen. We apologize if that's happened in, in uh, those rare occasions. We do a lot of work to try and get feedback from tourists, both when they leave the conservancy and through the likes of TripAdvisor. Uh, and, and by and large, we believe that we haven't had any issues there. Uh, and again, for us, what's important is that we are able to um, fund ourselves through the likes of the cattle operation and the tourism. Um, and at the moment, we believe we have the right balance, but your comment is noted and we'll keep on top of that for the future. Okay, so I'd like to hand over next to Anit Mitchell, our Head of Tourism, who's going to take you through what we offer from a tourist experience point of view. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anit Mitchell. I'm the Tourism Manager of our Predator Conservancy and very excited to be doing our first live webinar today. Um, as Rob and Richard have already touched on, welcoming visitors to our Pedita is extremely important for us, not just in terms of revenue, but also for environmental education. As we all know, um, tour Kenya's, Kenya's tourism has been facing uh, quite a major challenge over the last um, year, if not longer. Um, so I thought it would be quite interesting to share some of our uh, figures with you. This slide shows um, the January, January to July um, visitor arrivals to Opedita. And you can see that actually versus a year ago, we're not doing too badly at plus 3% with our visitor numbers. Um, I think it's very important to note that within these visitor numbers, um, first of all, we're a very big conservancy. Uh, the 2020 plans that Rob has uh, just spoken about, we've got very clear indications about the maximum capacity of vehicles and tourists that uh, we can allow into this area um, so as to maintain a good visitor experience for all of our clients. Um, within this plus 3% uh, of uh, visitor arrivals, um, about 20%, we're about 20% up um, on domestic vi vis visitors versus a year ago. Unfortunately, though, we are um, down on our international arrivals. Um, this is a concern, of course, because the international uh, visitors do tend to bring in the, the money that is, is needed uh, to keep this uh, conservancy running. But we're really delighted at the same time that uh, we're having such a success with the domestic market. Like I say, it is all about education for us and to be able to share what we do on our Pegeta with our visitors is hugely important. Um, which leads me quite nicely onto our conservation activities. Um, we have always maintained that we want to educate people that come to the Conservancy, so we have de designed um, a series of activities uh, that include tourists in the work that we do here. Um, this, these activities, especially the lion tracking, um, basically allow visitors to get involved in the work that we do on the Conservancy um, and genuinely take part in um, conservation work and conservation activities. The lion tracking, for example, um, in the center of this sheet, you'll see a lion identification sheet. 
we encourage tourists to go out lion tracking. Um, when they see lions, uh, whether they're collared or not, we're very happy for information on all lions, um, but we encourage tourists to fill out this sheet. They learn about how to identify a lion through whisker, mark, whisker spots. Um, they record any facial scars, ear tears, uh, the color of the lion's nose. They make a note of what the lion are up to, whether there are um, adults or sub-adults or cubs, or do they look like they're in good condition? Once this form is filled out, this gets sent to our ecological monitoring department, who use all of the information that have been gathered um, to put onto their database and also to record which lines have been seen where. It really helps our teams on the ground. We're a big conservancy. We've got several people working here, um, but obviously if we can get tourists involved in this kind of work, not only do they have an extremely informative time, but they leave knowing that they have contributed to conservation work and real conservation work. We also provide all of our visitors with bird checklists, mammal checklists. Um, we've designed a tariff that is full of information about the conservancy, how to behave on the conservancy code of conduct. Um, we've got uh, fact sheets on all of the activities that we offer, as well as a concertina, which we um, do hand out at the gate, which informs people on all of the places that they can go to on the conservancy, including um, the equator sign, uh, the Rhino Cemetery, uh, Marani Information Center, and Baraka the Black Rhino. Um, basically, we're trying to educate everybody that comes through this conservancy as to what um, they can do here uh, for the better good of their own experience. There are different places to stay on our Pedita Conservancy. Um, all of this information is showing in depth on our website, and I do encourage you to go and visit our website. It's brand new, actually, with all of our new branding, which Rob will speak to you later about, um, but we're very proud of it. Uh, places to stay, we have a range of different facilities from bush camping to uh, luxury tented camps with only six tents um, to better known properties, I should say, such as Sweetwater's Tented Camp, who have been um, on our Pegeta basically since day dot. Um, all of these properties offer something different, not one is the same. Um, each one has, uh, they're in a different side of the conservancy um, and uh, they offer a very, very different experience. I'm not sure that you could go to any one of these camps and compare it to another one that is, that is on the conservancy. We also have um, adventure uh, camps, uh, Rifali Adventures, who is on in the conservancy, but the access is through um, the outside of our gate, and they offer bike rides um, within the conservancy, etc. Um, so uh, we're very, very blessed actually to have a, a massive selection of um, different accommodation available on Orpedita. Um, this photograph is of our entry gate. Now, for many of you who have been supporting our Pedita for a long time, you will notice a big difference. Um, we have been spending quite a lot of time and money investing into our visitor experience, which includes the infrastructure. This gate used to be one little tiny room, um, and not much really happened here other than you know, revenue collection from our ticket entries. Um, we have recently taken over the management of this gate from a third party, so we are now wholly responsible for the visitor experience from the second that they arrive onto the conservancy. We've added small touches such as um, uh, big posters outlining um, various activities that happen on the conservancy. We're very aware that sometimes uh, visitors don't get to hear all about our Pedita Conservancy, so we really try and share as much information as we can through these visual posters. The other advantage of taking over the gate is that um, we have uh, introduced an online booking system. Uh, this is a really big development for our Pedita and one that we're very, very proud of. As far as I know, in Kenya, we're the only um, conservancy that has, has done this. Um, all of your entry tickets can be bought online and we also do sell accommodation um, online as well. 
Um, essentially, if you're booking online, uh, we have introduced a 10% discount um, so that we really do encourage online payments. Uh, there's two advantages to this. One is obviously it reduces our cash handling at the gate, which is very important to us. Uh, but secondly, this allows your visitors a quicker entry into Opedita Conservancy. I would like to end as much as I can talk about, to be honest, on, on the uh, tourism facilities on Opedita, but we, we're sort of slightly limited to time when we combine everything. Um, but I would like to end with a TripAdvisor comment. For me, the biggest thing that we can possibly do on Opedita is to develop our people, our guides, our infrastructure, all of which adds to a fantastic visitor experience. This TripAdvisor comment basically sums up everything that we've been doing, including things like our gates, um, sorry, the shop at our gates, as well as our chimpanzee adoptions. Um, I'll quickly read it out loud to you. Um, we were really impressed. On arrival at the gate, we were welcomed with big smiles and asked to enter the office to purchase the tickets. After signing in on an iPad, we were sent off by the sanctuary staff, wishing us a great safari. The National Park has a lot to offer. We have seen giraffes, white rhinos, lions, zebra, buffalo, and many more. Our main interest, though, was to visit the chimpanzee sanctuary. Amazing work is done here, which convinced us to adopt two of the rescued chimpanzees. This gave us the opportunity to look behind the scenes, and we were allowed to be a part of the feeding of the 24 chimpanzees in this part of the sanctuary. Amazing how they all slowly arrived from all over the sanctuary to grab their bananas and other fruits. The chimpanzee conversations, the noises they make, are one of a kind. Please do it and help this project by adopting. Another amazing project they have is the support of a blind black rhino, which is completely dependent on human help to survive. You can visit the rhino and feed it as well. Again, I have to point out that each employee of the park was super friendly and helpful. They should win a prize for that. I have visited many parks, other parks in Kenya, and the experience was quite different. I'm extremely proud of this TripAdvisor comment, and it is one of many that are showing um, on our TripAdvisor page. Please do have a look. Uh, it gives a real insight into the developments and work that we're doing here uh, for tourism on our page to conservancy. Super. Let's... There's quite a few questions that have come in whilst we've been talking. What we'll do is we'll keep going through because we're not a million miles off the end, and then we'll go through the questions at the end of the session. So as I said, um, our head of marketing at the moment is, is aware to weddings, so um, I'm going to cover this section at the moment. Um, we just thought we'd give you an idea. You know, the truth of the matter is we do our marketing with next to no budget. Um, you know, we're on a knife edge in terms of funding the core conservation and community development work. Uh, and as a result, everything we do, we do on a shoestring. But that said, we're always looking not to try and compromise on quality. What's helped us enormously has been an army of um, well-wishers and people who've done an awful lot of work for us pro bono and who've contributed their time or have uh, exchanged their time uh, in instead to come over and have a trip to the Conservancy and take part. So, for example, one of the first things that we've been doing is, is launching our new website, which we're very excited about. Um, feel free, please, to go and have a look online. Uh, but that's literally just launched within the last few weeks. Uh, and again, that was down to some uh, incredible uh, work that was done really at, at a fraction of the value of what they've contributed. The other thing is that we've started really doing is, is marketing locally. Um, the truth is that we make an awful lot of our money uh, from international visitors, but we fundamentally see the domestic market as critical. You know, it, it's, it has to be um, top of our priority list to have Kenyans come and see and value and enjoy the wildlife that's in their country and is their heritage. Uh, and so, you know, we've been very lucky to have partnerships with such uh, media groups as The Star, who contributed huge amounts of media coverage for us, uh, free of charge. Uh, you know, we've even been advertising on, on the main roads in Nairobi uh, for those who are stuck in the horrible traffic in the fumes. that can't be much better than escaping to the, the fresh air of Laikipia and Olpegeta. Um, and again, as I said, you know, this really is for us about, um, you know, this isn't about revenue. This is about um, really making sure that we have the chance to inspire people about our petita. Another thing that we've done, um, you know, in talking to a lot of agents, operators, tourism partners and camps on the conservancy, the conservancies and parks in Kenya tend not to do very much. It's sort of, here's the price and off you go. 
Whereas what we're trying to do is now actually be a bit more proactive and say, do you know what? We're going to create a calendar at the start of the year and we're going to run a series of promotions throughout the year. So it might be three on three for two on nights. We do things like grown ups go free or kids go free. Um, you know, we've really mapped that out for the whole year with, with different specific pushes through the year. And we share that with our tourism partners um, more than a year in advance. This actually is the promotion already for 2016 lockdown. It's going to be the same as 2015. Um, and that gives everybody the chance to get their message, their marketing messages out there much earlier. You know, we are very keen to, um, you know, promote offers and, and activities through our tourism partners. A lot of what we do um, in aiming to be cost effective is using online tools where for relatively low cost, we can uh, reach and engage with quite a large number of people. Um, over the last 12 months, we've seen a really spectacular rise in our email database. Uh, we desperately don't want to be one of those awful spammer organizations that just send stuff out so people can unsubscribe at any time. But we're, we're there with interesting conservation information, uh, news articles, and we've been very pleased with the sort of opening and click rates that we're getting from people, which shows they really do want to hear a lot of that information. Uh, so that's been a big part of what we do. But the bit I think that's been, for us, directionally one of the most exciting has been our social media uh, engagement. So, you know, we're up nearly double um, in the last 12 months, up 81%. Uh, and that's been across lots of different social media outlets from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter. But what I think has been really, to frankly, a bit surprising, but very exciting has been that, you know, our perpetual fear is that you just add people to a database, but they really don't want to hear from you. Whereas now, if we look at the data about how many people are actually engaging with us, so they're sharing the things that we post or they're commenting on them or they're clicking on like, you know, we're up sort of, you know, by a multiple of five times. Uh, and that for us is fantastic because it means we're not just adding people, but we're actually having a conversation with them and getting them engaged in conservation. Uh, and that's what we're looking to do. That said, we still do also do a lot of work in traditional media. Uh, and these days, a lot of the uh, online newspapers and magazines. Um, and obviously, we've been helped enormously by the plight of the northern whites. It sounds terrible to say that we're being helped by the plight of a, a dying species. But it is important to get that message out there. You know, the northern whites are in a dreadful situation down to the last four of their, of their species or subspecies. You know, people don't believe it could happen to the black rhino, for example, but it very much could. And that's why we think it's very important that the northern whites are a vehicle for that message to say, look, we, you know, extinctions can happen in situations where we can prevent them. Uh, and, and this is what we want to do about it. And those messages have led to an explosion globally of coverage. Uh, for a four month period, sort of February to May, we were getting between 15 million and 20 million people reached across the world through uh, TV, online, traditional newspapers, you name it. Uh, and that's something that we've been tremendously excited to be a part of. Um, and we really do hope, as, as Richard was saying before, that we can take this forward by uh, having a successful IVF program with the Northern Whites and, and continue this story uh, on a global basis. So that's really what we do in our marketing. It's, it's not um, technically complicated. A lot of it is on a shoestring. Uh, and I guess the two things that have really helped us this year are you know, the incredible kindness of people who've donated their time. Uh, and secondly, um, you know, providing messages that people want to read about and are interested in. And so triggering that kind of sharing uh, avalanche, which is what gets us the reach. So rather than just paying to hit people over the head with a sledgehammer, we're trying to provide stuff that people want to share and read about. And that's uh, really helped us uh, with our marketing. So that, that's it from, from me on the marketing side. That's also it from us on the whole presentation. We didn't want to keep people for too long. Um, we'd always planned this session to be about an hour. So what we plan to do now is just run through um, the questions that have come up. Um, so um, William, do you want to just go to the top and we'll go through one by one? So we answered the first two questions. Let's go to the next one. Um, the wild dogs. Um, uh, one of our posters has said that they had the pleasure of photographing the wild dogs three times over three days whilst at Sweetwaters uh, and understands that they have now currently moved out to other conservancies and what will cause them to return if they do. Um, this person will be back in October for three more days and would like to know more. So, Richard, would you um, like to? Yeah, no, it's a very difficult question to answer, I'm afraid, but um, there's two, th two comments I would make is, um, number one, there are still wild dogs here. They, they haven't all moved out. Moved out. Um, uh, they do move on and off on a regular basis, but there is a, 
a resident group um, that stay on the Conservancy, and they're often often seen. Um, the big packs, um, you know, wild dogs have a habit of ranging over huge areas, and the big packs um, do that, and we have no idea when they're going to come back. Um, but they, one thing I do know, and we we know, is that they they make use of old pediatry on a regular basis. So like all wildlife, uh, it's to some extent potluck, uh, but we're still we're still a wild dog destination. Um, and a lot of people see them. And um, if, you, if you need more up-to-date information before you do arrive, uh, please do email um, me at info at um, and I'll give you all of the latest information as to where wild dogs are or if they're likely to be around. So some of them are collared, and we do have a, uh, an aerial set that allows us to, uh, to, to track them, provided they're close enough. So as said, info at olpegetaconservancy.org. Any questions before a trip, and we'll get straight back to you. The next question is, how do you break through the clutter when it comes to donations? The wildlife category is packed with competition. How do you get them to bond with your brand? <laughs> this is the eternal question that we ask ourselves a lot at the moment. Um, it's, the honest answer is it's very difficult. And in fact, Olpegeta is possibly not the right organization to ask because you know, a lot of our expertise has been built around commercial revenues and not so much donations. We're now looking at trying to build that area up um, to try and do better and bring in the skills. We've had quite a lot of um, success this year. Um, very often, it's really not so much about marketing. It's much more about um, networks and finding people who we can connect to um, and who help us out. Um, we've done particularly well with things like um, uh, crowd raising. So, for example, with the Northern Whites, where we've raised, you know, um, 150, nearly $200,000 in the last year. That's come from something like 4,000 different donors. Um, and that's all sort of 20, $10 donations at a time. And we see that as being quite important. We've also had a bit of success with things like um, Indiegogo, which is um, crowdsourcing or crowd raising, where you give something back in return, like t-shirts or trips. Um, I think that kind of thing is very important. And the last bit we've started to get a bit of traction with is, um, uh, fundraising by connecting to corporates. So, for example, uh, we had a link up with a number of major FMCG companies in Nairobi uh, where they gave us a proportion of each pack sold over a promotional period, and we saw money coming in that route. But to be honest with you, in this field, if you really want to change the game and raise the big funds that we need for expansion, um, we think the future really is, is getting proper personalized networks into high net worth individuals um, rather than just the $20 at a time. We see that as critical, and every single dollar we receive, we're grateful and we think is important, uh, but we think you have to go after every aspect of fundraising. Let me just add a couple of things there very quickly. I think one of the, one of the parts of our model which is really important is the fact that we, we generate a lot of our own revenue through commercial activity. Um, what that means is that for every, um, you know, if we're, we're already raising six million dollars a year, which basically pays um, for the costs of running the conservancy, and we're doing that ourselves. So any 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 dollar that comes in from a donor can be applied directly and one hundred percent to either conservation or community development. We don't have to take any kind of admin charge, which is typical of most of the sort of NGO world. Uh, and, and we have the um, based on the fact that we exist in this environment, we have the ability to apply that money. Uh, very effectively. So I think I think we can position ourselves also as the biggest black rhino sanctuary in East Africa as something which should be very attractive for donor, donors uh, going going forward. Um, and the last thing I'd say in terms of how do you get them to bond with your brand, I think the one thing that we've got that's quite different to a lot of NGOs is we are a very experiential brand. You can physically turn up at our gate and come and stand in the bush and come and meet the wildlife. Uh, and that tends to get a lifelong connection with people in a way that NGOs who are more of a virtual organization globally can't do. Um, next question that was up, is information collected on lions and other species readily available to the public if they want access to it? The answer is yes, if, if people are interested. Again, um, info at allpegetaconservancy.org, but we're, we are happy to supply people with information about what we do. Um, uh, be that within ecological monitoring or um, in any other facet of what it is, you know, what it is that Old Pegeter is is trying to achieve. So the, the answer is, a, is an emphatic yes. Okay. I mean, really, it's back to that idea of being role models. If someone has a question where they'd like something released, info at olpegeterconservancy.org and we'll see what we can share. Um, and it really will be most things. 
Uh, one of our listeners has asked, um, I can't remember having received the promotions calendar in my newsletter, could we send it again? Um, and we will um, work on getting something out shortly. So an equal look at what we can do um, in due course. We'll make sure that's done. If you don't get something in the next 10 days, please get back in touch through info at, and we'll make sure that we fix whatever's not working there. Okay. I just I just want to clarify, when we first did this promotional calendar, it was really targeted at the tourism partners. Um, but we've since, having tried and tested some of our uh, fantastic promotions, we've realized that um, we're actually on a good platform right now to share much wider. So uh, yes, we'll get something to you shortly. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry, do you work closely with the Asian market to educate the population and key influence on the dangers and consequences of illegal rhino horn trade? I'll pass on to Richard for this one, but just to be clear for us, um, really the whole poaching issue cannot be fixed without looking at both sides of the equation, the supply and the demand. And I'll let Richard say a few more words on that. Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, we do. Uh, we're linked up with a number of organizations who are working in the Far East. Uh, and who are running campaigns in the Far East to try to diminish demand for both rhino horn and ivory. Um, so there, there's, there's a number of these organizations um, and they often work with celebrities um, to do public service announcements uh, and advertisements on Far Eastern TV, uh, etc. To, to try to get this message across. Uh, one example was Yao Ming who was here about 24 months ago. He's a Chinese basketball player uh, who's somewhat taller than me. Um, who, who, um, who has been very successful, in fact, with an organization called Wild Aid uh, in raising awareness about the trade in shark fin and diminishing demand for shark fin, shark fin in China. Um, and we hope that he can be equally successful uh, with regard to ivory. So the, the answer is yes, but wherever there are other opportunities to do this, uh, if anybody's got any ideas, again, info at Old Page, we'd love to hear about it. Very good. Thank you for thanking us for the helpful information. Um, next one, um, where can you find more info on the activities during September? Um, yes, so I mean, one of the, uh, one of, uh, sorry, someone has asked how can they find out more info on some of the offers that are happening because things like, um, I mean, you've kindly written that you just did a night drive recently and it was an amazing experience and you'd like to know more about activities with promotions. So in, in September, I believe there is a, a promotion where if you pay full price for your first activity, you get the second activity at half price. We have tried to um, promote this uh, on Facebook. I believe a post went out. Um, but uh, thank you for this. We will make sure that we hit out again to our database to promote again. Um, and thanks very much for, for commenting on the night game drive and the land tracking. I, for everyone that's listening, I, I really do encourage you to um, like us or follow us on, on Facebook uh, and to be on the email uh, database. If you just send an email to info at, we are regularly sending out some fantastic offers. We uh, have been having something called Monday Madness, where we have some special offers uh, available. Uh, the beauty of the new online booking system is that we are able to offer um, you know, all sorts of offers um, very, very easily. Um, next question, I think there's only one more after this. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has been integral in the long-term sustainability of other conservation efforts in Kenya. Is there a relationship with the Nature Conservancy, TNC, at Old Pedita? Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, you know, we, you know, I regularly personally meet with um, the Africa representative. Uh, TNC themselves are working more closely with um, a range of other conservancies slightly north of us, as opposed to Old Pedita. Um, that's not to say they aren't helping us. They've been a fantastic advisory service. But at the moment, um, investment-wise, Alpedita is sustaining itself from a, um, an operations point of view. And so TNC is much more of a sort of advisory and partnership as opposed to uh, an investor at this point. And the very last one, someone has very kindly said, thank you, very insightful, and thank you very much for your comments. So that's everybody's questions. Remarkably, we're finishing on the nose an hour later. Uh, um, I've just got one more comment to make. We talked a lot about info at Alpedita and my horrible experience of info at uh, type email addresses is that they never get answered. Um, just rest assured that if you do send an email to info at, it will be answered, um, even if it takes a couple of days. So anyway, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much with that. Yeah, we do take that very, very seriously. And Anika is looking with horror. She says, I will absolutely answer. The info account comes to the tourism office, so I can guarantee that you will get a response as quickly as possible. 
So everybody, thank you very much for listening. We're going to do two of these a year, so we'll send out a note in, in, in six months' time. But we really appreciate your time, and thank you for listening. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.